Um, all right, well, first of all, I want to thank you and the music department, uh, you know, for giving us the opportunity. Of course, Lisa, that makes us always look good with this, you know, discussion and, and records for the archives. Um, such an important uh, thing, right? Because we had in the past uh, uh, huge maestros, no? Was, uh, talking about different, um, not only mentorship, but what it meant to be for them, uh, artists and musicians and, uh, and all that, that helped also the younger ones or the younger players like my student here, Jesse. But um, I think that today is about, um, it's about starting a conversation. I mean, me and I'm sure Giovanni too, as uh, musicians that were kind of foreign, that we came here and now we call New Orleans home, um, being able to fit in has been very easy, right? Uh, this is a city of music lovers. So we came here, I don't know, you can talk about your experience, but um, my experience is that I came over here and uh, I, I felt the love uh, for music of all the people of New Orleans. Um, maybe not as much classical guitar or classical music, but music in general. And that helps because it helps you also uh, have a broader understanding of, of your profession and, uh, and your musicianship. Um, being able to play even, I don't consider myself a, a jazz player, but being able to play with jazz musicians uh, had also opened my understanding of music and my approach. So I think that's, uh, for me, it's liberating and it's fun. Uh, it's a way to connect with the community too. So uh, the reflection was, I would like to know more about guitar in New Orleans, right? And I was trying to find out, I was trying to ask questions. And I couldn't find much uh, uh, about anything that was already published or written about the history of the guitar in New Orleans. Being this our sixth uh, New Orleans International Guitar Festival, the first one coming um, you know, out of the pandemic, I thought that it would be great for this kind of like renaissance to kind of start the conversation for this to be recorded, of course. And, and, and now that I have also uh, John Rankin here, uh, so what better way to start? Uh, um, a conversation about the history of guitar in New Orleans or whatever their experiences are. I think that when we talk about history, the best way to record it, the best way to talk about it is with living experiences like these, right? And also our own experiences of, of people that came from um, other countries and, and we kind of like adapted also into the musical scene here in New Orleans. So I have also Matt. Um, Matt is the the study person for, for uh, folk and roots music and all that. So maybe you want to start a, a, any kind of question or any kind of uh, conversation? Well, um, I, I, ha I, I have a sort of 10 minutes to talk a little bit about some aspects of guitar in New Orleans, awesome. if you want me to just go okay, do that. Okay, so we could do I don't that. I want to take too long. Okay, so um, Matt, if you don't know him, he's a professor here at Tulane. Um, and also I have Carl LeBlanc, and I have uh, John Ranking. These are the real New Orleanians, right? We are here, the imposters. <laughs> Not really, but uh, Giovanni is also now in the in the guitar department, and uh, he's a Brazilian guitarist. And um, and so that's what we kind of want to do. I want to hear their own experiences. I'm sure that everybody has uh, questions, you know, because the first thing that comes to mind is New Orleans is a musical city, right? Uh, so what's happening with guitar, right? Okay. So go on if you want. Cool, cool. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Javier asked me to do this and I said, I really don't know anything uh, about this sp specifically, except that I play guitar and I moved to New Orleans in, in 97 and I've studied the music here, I guess, for 25 years now, which is crazy. Um, and, and as a guitarist, as you walk around this city, um, I think you, you, you see a couple of things. Um, and, and, and and I don't mean to, to, to marginalize the guitar anyway, but I think that the guitar has, has maybe struggled in New Orleans a little bit to find its place, right? This is a music town, um, but it's not a big guitar town. It's really a horn and drum town and a little bit of a piano town. And those of us, those of you who are guitarists who, who've tried to make it, uh, you could speak to that um, um, better than me, but I wanted to talk a little bit um, throughout history when the guitar and, and the banjo as well, um, kind of kind of show up and carve out a, a space. So so, if we went back to the late 1800s, um, in addition to the emergence of jazz, you had a time in New Orleans and throughout the South where there were a lot of what were called string bands, right, which were um, uh, 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 you know violin 
based, but also guitar based uh, music ensembles that would play uh, written and improvised music and the guitar really had a spot there. Um, and as jazz began to emerge, the, the guitar would appear in some of those ensembles. So actually the first picture we have of Buddy Bolden from I think 1906 or so, um, Buddy Bolden as the, the kind of agreed upon first ja jazz musician, though that's maybe not always agreed upon, but, but uh, in the picture is Willie Cornish on, on guitar, right? And, and, and looking back on it, it seems unusual, um, but there were violin players in jazz too. And what happened in um, 1917 when the first jazz recording was made by the original Dixieland Jazz Band, and it was um, horns and drums and bass um, and, and piano, um, that really helped kind of solidify what the New Orleans Jazz Ensemble was supposed to be, and the violin went away. So there's an interesting story, for example, about Manuel Mineta, they call him Fess Mineta. He, he kind of puts down his violin at that point and switches over to piano. And, and so the, the place for the guitar-like instrument it, from that point on in the 20s um, really switches over to the banjo. And, and I think it's mostly because the banjo is louder. And so these New Orleans, um, you know, strum, strum, strumming musicians pick the banjo because it can project more because of the resonator. But they do something, I think, pretty unique in the United States, which is they tune it like a guitar. So the banjo throughout the, the South and Appalachia, where we associate it with, is tuned differently. But in New Orleans, um, people like Johnny St. Cyr, um, uh, Narvin Kimball, who I think you, you knew, you worked with, right? I believe they would tune it like a guitar and then strum it with, with the left hand patterns that we associate with the guitar, and then they could easily go back and forth. And I think um, for a lot of us who were lucky to see him, like Danny Barker um, was probably the great kind of ambassador of that tradition, and, and Carl as well, um, in the, up, up until the edge of the, the 20th century. So um, it, it, it's unique. At that time, um, big bands were taking off in the United States. The electric guitar came in, so you have people like Charlie Christian, you know, strumming in these big bands and other places. In New Orleans, if, if you were, were known for traditional jazz, it really stayed with the banjo in that spot. So sometimes if you go to Preservation Hall or the Palm Court and you see these traditional ensembles, that banjo will still be there. Yeah, so the, the, a few other people I wanted to mention is one is there was an incredible musician named Lonnie Johnson. Uh, who, who was born in New Orleans, I think, in, in, in 1899. Uh, great um, guitarist and a violinist and um, left New Orleans and became associated with, with blues music. But um, to me, he's really a, a, an example of a type of guitar player in New Orleans, which is he could play anything. I mean, he could play ragtime. He could play modern jazz. Uh, he could play blues. Um, and I think that type of player crops up again and again in New Orleans. John and Carl, um, uh, um, Walter Wolfman, Washington. Um, uh, um, trying to think of, of who else kind of kind of fits that bill. Don Vappy. Don Vappy. The the people who you you might show up on a gig on Tuesday night and they're playing straight blues, and you show up on Wednesday night and they're playing like contemporary jazz music. You know, people in New Orleans say. Musicians say, you know, music for all occasions, and how many times do we go out in New Orleans and you see you all chatting, you know, you walk on stage, uh, so what are we playing tonight? <laughs> you know, it, it, someone counts one, two, three, four, and the, and the, the band comes in, right? So, um, yeah, I think uh, 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 in terms of the, the kind of musical analysis aspect of it, I, I think one thing we know as guitarists is we're responsible for, for the harmony, for the chord changes and so the guitar um, is equivalent to the piano in that way and then different from the many many other instruments of, of New Orleans music that, that play melodically but don't support the group. So you also see a lot of solo guitarists like, just like solo pianists out on a gig right and that of course you know not too many of us want to go here like a solo trumpet player <laughs> playing alone all night long right but but you'll see and and i think that's a t particular type of musical mindset where you've you've got to be able to entertain people um as one musician and so you've got to be able to 
to play harmony and melody, you've got to be able to, to know a, a large amount of repertoire. It's almost, um, you know, we say idiomatic. The guitar is idiomatic in that way in that um, we, we wind up doing certain things that maybe a pianist can do, but, but not too many other people do. So yeah, the only other traditions I was going to draw attention to is we, did, we do have a great blues tradition in New Orleans. Um, uh, Freddie King today, but also going back to, to um, Snooks Eaglin uh, when I moved here, was ending his career. Um, uh, there was a guy named Guitar Slim back in the 50s who everyone would talk about, you know, played the screaming blues music. He had a, a hundred foot long guitar cable and, and you hear all these stories about him going out into the audience in the do drop in and out, out onto LaSalle Street, you know, uh, ripping these kind of guitar solos. Um, uh, uh, and, and there are guitars like that today in New Orleans. Um, I call them the, the sort of showboaters. Uh, Anders Osborne, um, June Yamaguchi, um, the Radiators, uh, um, some other um, real screaming guitar players. But um, without criticizing them at all, I think, I think New Orleans is maybe more known for um, really tasteful musicians, that guitar players that kind of serve the song and don't necessarily overplay uh, that aren't playing, you know, three or four minute epic <laughs> distorted guitar solos. That's not really the New Orleans way. The New Orleans way is, is you find your place in the ensemble, you serve the song, the singer, the soloist, and when it's your turn, you step up, you know. And so I, I think again of, of um, Earl King, Leo Nocentelli, um, uh, Joy Clark is a great guitar player out today, and again, you know these these musicians here, uh, where where they're that 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 to me is is the kind of mainstream guitar tradition in New Orleans. You know, maybe not uh, as famous as the trumpet players and the pianists and the drummers, um, but but musicians who are total complete musicians that really serve mm -hmm. um, what's what's called for at any gig. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's wonderful. That sets up a little bit um, about my intention to ask. Um, all three of our guests uh, about their own musical experience. I want to start with uh, Carl. Carl, I would love to know your experiences, like your first uh, musical experiences, even with the guitar. How was, uh, what were you, uh, how was it growing up, you know? First musical experiences, uh, I guess the operative term would be musical because when I got the guitar, it was harder than I thought it would be, right? So uh, for the first two years, the guitar was in the case under the bed, you know, until uh, uh, the guys in the neighborhood realized that I had a guitar and I had already learned how to tune it. I went to uh, Ace uh, Music School on uh, with, with streets that on Zaga and, and Russia Blade Street. And I think Daryl Levine's father was teaching me uh, guitar and I, I got through Little Brown Jug and some songs like that. But it wasn't until uh, the guys that were going to Joseph S. Clark, they had a band called the Sonics. And I was in about seventh grade at Corpus Christi and their uh, guitar player quit. Pete Adams, who's the nephew of Justin Adams, so he quit the band and they had a gig that weekend. So they came and asked my mother, could I come play with them? And, uh, she said, well, take care of my son, Kenneth, you know, so, it, and that's what was my introduction into New Orleans music, playing at clubs like the Wonderful Boys Club, and uh, they had really a fertile environment to just gig, where I, where I grew up in the Seventh Ward on uh, what is today AP Turo, it was called London Avenue there, where London Canal is at the end of that street, but, uh, from my house, there was uh, the Autocrat Club and on the corner, Jewelry's and uh, down this way, the Pentagon Hall and uh, Le Chat Boutique, which later became Club 2004. And then there was the Celebrity, which is now uh, Bertha's. And just, there was about five or six clubs uh, walking distance from my front door. You know, I could almost see them and so, I was able to go to those clubs and ask musicians, uh, you know, what's that you doing? Show me how to do that. And as I got a little older, they would say, come on and you can play a song or two. And uh, so my first musical experiences in New Orleans would have to be, I'd say, being 
taken under the wing uh, by some musicians who saw something in me and decided that they would give me some time. Uh -huh. So the, the musical instruction that you would get were, was by going to these places and asking, just I want to know what you know how how to play what you do you are playing. Did you get the the support from your family that or how was that when you started with? You said you had a guitar already, so how, how was well, that provided? No, I, to you? I got the guitar. No one in my family played music. My my dad said he had a sister who played violin, but they had moved to California, so I didn't have anyone. Uh, I didn't have a musical family like the Marcelluses or the Nevilles or you know the. The, the long line of everyone in the family being able to play. But there were people in the neighborhood, uh, Louis Barbaran, uh, Paul Barbaran's brother, uh, Isidore Barbaran's son, Danny Barker's first cousin, they lived right around the corner. So Louis would, would sit me down and try to show me some chords, but he was a drummer, so he really couldn't, uh, you know, show me a lot about guitar. But uh, I'm sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> no, just that. Like, how was the support that you got from your family? Your, you know, the environment. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested as being, you know, African American growing up. And what, what were the experiences? I, were you limited at, at any point, you know, to pursue the, the that musical dream, or you know, or no, not limited at all. I would even say propelled, uh -huh. you know, because uh, as you were walking down, they had all these musicians. They were getting bands together. Everybody had a band in each neighborhood, every high school, and you walk down the street. You hear somebody knock on the door. Hey, my name's Carl. You know, they'd let you in the living room, and before you know it, you could play with their band. If you could, if you knew the songs and could play with them, you know, you were included. It was a, a community where the music was uh, was not hoarded. Like you know, well, this is this is mine. It was like okay, let, let, music is for us all. And I guess they could bring that to a sort of an African tradition where the, uh, there's a song for each ceremony. There's a song for a wedding. I knew that was going to happen. Excuse me. <laughs> Great my, ringtone. My daughter, I'll call her back. <laughs> uh, okay, there's a song for a wedding. Here comes the bride. There's a song for a birthday, you know, happy birthday. But. Uh, in Africa, there's a song for the sun when it comes up. There's a song for when it rains, you know. So the, the music is more than just for uh, entertaining. And uh, it, it's, it's a part of everyday life. There's a song to wash your clothes, you know. There's a song to, 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 to cut the potatoes. <laughs> there's a, and so I think in New Orleans, the music was more a part of uh, everyday life than now, my generation was a little different because uh, <clears throat> I was born in 55, so uh, when I started playing music, it was the 60s, and that was the heyday of the guitar. And uh, every song, every record came to a clim climax with the screaming guitar solo, you know, like the rock, you know, and that rock and roll was the, was the, the palette on which guitar music was... Uh, was founded, but classical guitar music, I did study when I got to college. I studied for a few years with Mr. Barrerio, Elias Barrerio, and he opened my eyes with the first thing he told me was, uh, I'm not gonna promise you that you'll ever be a famous guitarist because there's people who've been practicing this music since they were children, you know, and I was like in my 20s by this time, he said, but I can teach you some things. And what he did show me was, well, first of all, finger picking style, I had never done that. I had always played with the plectrum, but uh, being able to use all my fingers well, I was introduced to that through the classical music repertoire. And then also technique because being a self-taught musician, I had never thought of the logical or the, the most sensible way to finger or to, uh, to maneuver around the neck of the guitar. You know, it was just, uh, okay, I know I had to play this note, I had to play this chord, and however I got there, as long as I got there on time with the rest of the band, because it was just, uh, and I tell my students today that they learn in the classroom, like Giovanni, and they have the students at NOCA and everything. Learning in the classroom is one thing, but I learned music in the ballroom, like it was supposed to be learned, not in the classroom, you know? So it was like trial and error, and in New Orleans, you said the black music, 
the black community would have no problem telling you, nobody don't want to hear that, put the jukebox on. You know, if they didn't like what you were doing, they didn't, they didn't have a problem letting you know. So you had to satisfy the audience uh, being entertainer and uh, yeah, you know, like, so the, the history of the, the musicians that I heard in my lifetime influenced how I play. And uh, I can't really say I tried to sound like anybody else because, uh, like you mentioned before, in fact, you talked about a lot of stuff I was going to talk about. I should have went Sorry. before you. Yeah, should've, you should have. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I never had a job other than playing music, so... Uh, being able to play in all these different situations with whoever called you, uh, that's, that's important to New Orleans musician. You have to know how to play, uh, you know, highbrow music or blues music or whatever you call to play if that's what's putting bread on the table. And uh, a lot of times I'll find myself on jobs where I really didn't want to be there, but I had to do it to eat, so I'd be like, what time is this gonna be over with? You know, like the, and those were some of the jobs, but uh, I wouldn't change any of it because I did learn so much just being in New Orleans and performing the style of music that, music that New Orleans brought to the guitar. The rhythms, you can tell the rhythms of New Orleans music are so different from rhythms anywhere else, you know I mean? Maybe uh, South American and Mexican, South American rhythms, you can see it, the African rhythms, you can see it a little bit, but the New Orleans rhythmic concept is, uh, is it's the foundation of, of uh, all American music, the blues, the rock and roll, it all, it all comes from that rhythm. And so the guys that I had a chance to hear were influenced by people like uh, Papoose, who was Fats Domino's first guitar player. And the whole while I was with Fats Domino's band, he was always telling me, Uncle Jack, Uncle Jack. he was trying to get me to play this rhythm that, that Papoose used to play. And as close as I, I always, I sit there for an hour and he would just be doing it and I would be doing, and I think I had, I had it. No, that's not it yet. And you know, it, I don't think I ever got it, you know, but that's why sometimes he would have three or four guitar players on the stage with him while he's performing. Cause he, I think he was always searching for that, for that sound that Papoose had. And you mentioned Snooks. I remember going down the street one day and passing the club and I heard a band inside and I opened the door and it wasn't a band, it was Snooks by himself. <laughs> you know, he's playing the bass line, he's playing the chords, he's singing, he's stomping on the floor like a bass drum. From the outside, he sounded like a whole band, you know, so Playing solo guitar uh, was an option. I played at Lou and Charlie's, my first solo uh, place. Charlie let me play there. I must have been about 17, 18, and he let me play there. Uh, but uh, Earl King, look, th this is a list of the, the ones. I just put together a list of guitar players from New Orleans. Uh, Papoose, Irving Bannister. Buddy Charles, who was Irving Charles' father, Andrew Phillips, who played on Oop Poopy Doo, Earl McLean, Leroy H., uh, Guitar Ray, Earl King, you know, uh, Roy Montrell, okay, they call him the devil, Roy, and some people say he was the best guitar player. Uh, guitar Slim, uh, the things I used to do. Curtis Trevine, uh, his, his uh, sister, Andre Trevine, was a newscaster here. And his, his mother didn't let me talk to him because she thought that if anybody brought a guitar around, that would bring him into relapse mode. So she ran me away, you know, get, get away from here with that guitar. Uh, but uh, Justin Adams, of course, Snooks Eaglin, and George Davis, who I took lessons with, George Davis left New Orleans and went to New York and played on Broadway for years. But uh, I took lessons from him uh, on telephone, and this was before they had uh, smartphones with video and Zoom and all of that, so I'd wait until after 9 o'clock when the prices went down for long distance, right? And, and I called him, and then we I put the phone there, and I'd play, and he would just tell me what to do and listen to what I was doing, and I took a few lessons from George Davis like that, long distance lessons, but uh, these these musicians had no problems in sharing 
their experiences and their knowledge with younger musicians. That's wonderful. Um, you talked about Elias Barreiro. Elias Barreiro is the very reason probably that we are here. Uh, Elias Barreiro was the founder of the guitar program here at Tulane. He started in 1967. So that was even before I was born <laughs> and I'm old. So uh, 40 plus years uh, uh, establishing a guitar program here. I know that uh, John, you, you had a, a, a personal and a, a professional relationship with him as a student as, as well. Um, what was it growing up uh, in New Orleans having another type of guitarist, right? In this case, a classical guitarist that took lessons with Segovia, uh, a concert uh, of classical music playing. I mean... Growing up? Yeah. Well, um, I grew up... When Elias came here, I was already in college, my second year of college at USL. So um, I moved here in 1959, and uh, I got involved with um, guitar because of Peter, Paul, and Mary and the Kingston Trio. I mean, I'm that far back. And But my mom was one of the four founding members of the, ja of the uh, jazz archives here, which was a Oral History Archive founded in 1957 by a Ford Foundation grant when uh, oral history was becoming an important aspect to history. And uh, Bill Russell, who is a great guy, uh, who bought me my first guitar and fixed it, my second guitar, and uh, Paul Crawford, who was a trombonist from Eastman, and uh, my mom, and let's see who I'd leave it. Oh, Dick Allen was the curator. So she took me to a lot of jazz funerals and down to Preservation Hall in the early years of that. Um, and I really came back to that music later. When I was in my teens and 20s, I was listening to modern jazz and New Orleans rhythm and blues. And it turns out Alan Toussaint was my hero at that time. I didn't know him. I had never played with him uh, at that time. and. Uh, I just love the sound of the piano. You know, I love those arrangements, and I felt it. So, and I I left for years. So, when I came back uh, uh, at the age of twenty nine to s study with Elias, and he, um, I was a fingerstyle player, and I had learned a lot of classical pieces strictly on my own. And so you can imagine, and Carl can imagine, you know, I had some work to do. Um, and he was a very tough teacher, I'll say. He, he was very strict uh, and didn't take any deviation from his plan. And I should say, too, he helped me incredibly uh, to organize my technique. Same thing Carl said. It changed everything. And I uh, found over time that the music that I was drawn to, even as a teenager, had the chord changes of New Orleans jazz. You know, so I learned Whining Boy from uh, Dave Van Ronk, the New York blues guitarist. And I didn't know it was Jelly Roll Morton. I just said, man, I love the chords on this song. And I used to love, um, my mom would record albums uh, from the jazz archives. So I got exposed to uh, Jesse Fuller, who was actually from Georgia, but he was a one-man band who wrote um, very ragtime type changes in songs and played the 12 string. So I kind of came to New Orleans when I came back, it kind of coalesced. I realized I was super involved with New Orleans music, but hadn't really studied it. So then I worked backwards from there. And after I went to business school, I, from my marketing professor, helped me realize that I was really what they call a niche marketer and that my real um, focus should be really on playing solo guitar in this town, finger style, or like a really average piano player, you know. Um, right? Yes. So that's a short. short no, no, but <laughs> yeah, but also um, Elias created the opportunity for um, some musicians in the city to be exposed to great uh, performers like Manuel oh. Barrueco. Oh, we were just talking gosh. because we had yeah. Manuel Barrueco play the first concert of our festival, and uh, and you also had a relationship of playing master classes for him and Sharon Isbin and, and a whole bunch of other guitarists that were very important as a referent um, in the world, right? Well, when I went to school at USL, I majored in theory and composition because there were no guitar programs. And also, I didn't know anything about the formal structure of music. So I studied every instrument but 
guitar, except I took some jazz lessons privately with Bobby Brooks over there, who is a kind of a Johnny Smith style player. Um, I didn't really realize how unique Elias was until I studied with him for a while to get all those master classes. He had Juan Marc Adal. I mean, um, there was a master class or two every year. And he had the concert series where he brought in four guitarists every year. They're sponsored by the university. And he'd have two in the fall and two in the spring. The GFA winner would come in. So there was a concert series here. And he did all that. He was not remunerated for that. He did that for his love of the guitar. And he recorded every single event and um, was so active in it. And again, he, he wasn't paid for that. That was all love. So that's been a resource to all musicians in New Orleans for the entire time he taught, which was, let's see, 40, 50 years? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, over 40 years. Yeah. Uh, over 40 years. Yeah. So, um, Amazing. Uh, in, in talking to him, I spent on the phone like 45 minutes a couple of days ago just to get a little bit of his own timeline here in New Orleans. Look, like when he got here in 1967, he said, uh, or a bit before that, that there was no classical guitar None playing, of course. And uh, so there he, was flamenco then. Right. So he was invited to play a concert at Loyola, and that's where kind of, you know, they discovered him. And so he, he quickly got hired to, to be a teacher here, to be a professor. And over the years, like you said, well, not only with his own students, but also bringing first class guitars from around the world, he kind of like enriched uh, finally the, the guitar, the classical guitar scene, uh, I should say, um, here. And, um, and also, uh, and this is the very reason we're here today, because I mean, I was hired by him and we started working together. And then once he retired, I started with the idea of bringing back that uh, guitar series, well, this uh, festival that we have now. Um, where Carl played our first one and, uh, and where Don Vappi also performed uh, uh, guitar and banjo and I wanted to talk about that a little bit. But um, also, Giovanni is part of the guitar festival. Uh, he's been part of it every year. And I want to hear from Giovanni too, as a, a, your perspective as a Brazilian coming from Brazil where music is so rich and important. I mean, uh, coming to the jazz uh, capital of the world, right? Uh, why was it important? What kind of situation you found yourself in when you came and when you went to study at UNO with, uh, with Steve Masakowski and, and all these things? Uh, my experience with jazz music started in like in 2007, I would say, and I was already, you know, like in the conservatory education for a good five years, studying classical music, classical guitar, and working with uh, music theory and composition harmony. But I had a teacher that introduced me to the, what he called the, the history, aesthetics, and language of jazz. You know, it was a, a very comprehensive class that he would just like show us, you know, like the trajectory. He had like that tree. I don't know if you, uh, like the jazz tree that starts with blues and goes all the way up to like modern jazz. And he would just like show us, you know, records he would have us read stuff and that's my my first experience like formally with jazz and that kind of like pointed me out to like the you know like that's the kind of music i want to play because even though i grew up in brazil like listening to music of brazil you know like all sorts of like popular music and classical music from brazil when i started doing the classical uh, education they started kind of imprinting in me this very conservative and racist ideology of like, you know, like it's more kind of like a uh, hygienist, you know, like eugenics in music. You can't really focus on popular music because popular music is not music. It's only classical music. If you're going to play Brazilian music, you got to be by Villa Lobos or all the other composers from that specific time that did not. It's ironic that Villa Lobos would play Chodos in the... In the <laughs> you know, but it's like the stylized music, you know, it's like he, he kind of like classified, if you can use that word, made the show music sound classical because he kind of like formalized it. But, you know, like long story short, I visited New Orleans for the first time in 2012 after, you know, like uh, graduating from college in classical guitar and being very frustrated with the uh, lack of possibility of working with uh, guitar 
in Brazil, you know, classically. And by then I was already playing jazz. Oh, thought I was playing jazz and my focus was, you know, I'm not gonna play Brazilian music because there are a lot of people that do it better than me. I'm gonna focus on jazz because that's kind of a niche and I can become somebody playing it. So I had the opportunity to come to, to New Orleans and that's when I met Carl Brock. And he, he, he was playing uh, at the time with the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra. And I saw one of their showcases at uh, uh, what not, nowadays is called the, the Jazz Playhouse. It used to be the Irvin Mayfield Playhouse at uh, Royal Sonesta on Bourbon Street. And I just looked him up, you know, because uh, one thing that uh, is very prominent, I think, in terms of like the history of the guitar is that like early on, although you have a lot of like white characters within the music in itself and they're the ones that are uh, project forward uh, as important in the history of the instrument. A lot of the first guitarists in the history of like New Orleans jazz, as you see pictures of it, you know, have a lot of black folk on and off, on and off, on and off. And then just like researching a little bit of New Orleans, you know, I couldn't really find a lot of black guitarists being portrayed, you know, like uh, forefront on the, in terms of like, you know, what is the face of guitar in New Orleans today? And when I saw uh, Carl LeBlanc, and it was like, hmm, I haven't seen this guy in none of the researches I did. So I searched out his name and finding his name online in his biography, I just like contacted him and it's like, man, like, can, you know, can I go see you play somewhere? He played at the Monteleon with uh, Chris Severin and... Jerry? Yeah. Jerry. Yeah, on drums. So I asked him, like, can I, can I take a lesson from you? It's like, you know, I'm, I'm a guitarist, you know, just like uh, uh, I'd love to like learn some, some, some jazz stuff, you know, like learn some of the, the New Orleans stuff that you, you, you play on your guitar, you know, like a lot of really, really modern language on the instrument that I've never seen in person or never really heard anything like that. You know? So he, he said, oh, like, come to my house tomorrow and you know, we can talk about it, you know, I can give you a lesson. Sit down, he tells me, like, play what you got. Like, I still had a lot of the, the classical stuff fresh in my hands. Like, I played all the classical repertoire I had. Boom. Good. Like, what's the jazz stuff that you have? Played all that, too. Like, good. You know, like, I really like the stuff you're playing. But, like, you said from Brazil, but you don't really play any Brazilian music. Do you play Brazilian music? Because, like, we as... Americans and jazz musicians, we love Brazilian music. I would love to see you play some Brazilian music if you if you don't mind. And it's like, and I didn't have anything expressive or on the same length of like uh, dedication that I had to like jazz music that I thought I knew how to play in classical. So the lesson he gave me is like, uh, that's the thing I'm gonna tell you. You know, it's like you play jazz, you play, you know, classical. Why don't you? Uh, blend these two styles of music and focus on the music of your country because like as, as somebody from the culture you are and you know like and you were black men from Brazil you know it's like most of Brazilian music is black music why don't you play that you know so that kind of like is what brought me to New Orleans I would say like five years later when I moved here kind of prepared to face the like the possibilities of not only you know focus on jazz but also being somebody who can defend himself playing the music that's culturally relevant for me mm -hmm. you know and like uh as you said you know, like you might be received uh, as a, a welcoming when you get to the city but sometimes it's like it's tricky because you might be welcomed to to do the like non-paying gigs here and like you have to fight for space on the on the music scene if you're not expressive or if you don't have like too much of a name or or you don't have the right connections and that's something that i faced when i first moved here and i was even like considering not focusing on music too much in 2015 but it's like you know, just like taking any gig possible just to get my name out and it's like, it's the thing that people do, you know, you get in, you sit in and you get known and you play with people and you like spread out the word that you, you like, you can play it even if you can't. So you just like learn on the spot and just like start to develop not only the network, but also the ability 
to be kind of a jack of all trades because like uh, Professor Sakakini said, you know, like there were situations and also uh, Mr. Kalabank also said that like you are in, in gigs that like, I've never played this kind of music before, but it's, it's, it's the call you have to make that, 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 that money and have to put the bread on the table. You know, like play, played Bulgarian music, played, you know, like Jewish music, never played Jewish music before. I played uh, music from uh, Morocco. I played Cuban music, played, you know. And as a guitarist from Brazil, I got labeled the guitarist from Brazil. So a lot of times I will be forced to play uh, the song from Brazil that everybody wants to play, which is the Go From Ipanema. And that's like, it's is 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 a blessing and a curse because as carl said that there is a specific rhythm to new orleans music that you gotta know it to play it properly there's music like any ethnic music they do have their own accent and that's something that whenever i'm required or forced or coerced to play the music with musicians from here there's a lack of knowledge about what this rhythm is for Brazilian music. Mm -hmm. So that in itself created uh, the, the spark for the research I do in my, my doctoral uh, program right now, which is, you know, just like the search for the groove and what is missing and why it misses like that, you know, just like working with music accent and all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, each one of you guys brought uh, your challenges, your experiences, and I think that we could pick any of the, of the little points that we've heard today and, and make another conversation. I think that this is a great way to start um, with, and, and we missed a lot. We've been talking for, for just an hour, but we, we, we're missing so, so much. But I think that it's a great opportunity that we come together uh, in, in this uh, festival where we have visitors from Spain, they're going to be performing uh, tomorrow and from uh, Cuba, and Miami. Um, and I think it's, it's great that we can showcase um, our own treasure. That's the, the music in New Orleans, the guitar in New Orleans that has a space, a definite space. And I think it's important that, um, that now we can kind of like make it official that, you know, we, we have this, uh, uh, you know, colleague thing going on and, and that we can, uh, you know, talk about uh, proudly about our roots here as foreigns or as New Orleanians in this case, you know. Um, I just want to thank everybody. I want to make sure that uh, you guys, if you have any questions um, at all, um, please, this is the time. <laughs> any, Brenda, the, the questions I wrote, you know? <laughs> No, I was just going to say maybe you can introduce each one of them, like by name, so that it's recorded. Yes. So on my left, I have uh, guitarist John Rankin. Uh, on my right, I have guitarist uh, Giovanni Santos. And I have uh, Carla Blanc, which we are honoring this year. Um, he decided to retire. I, we don't believe it because he just told me yesterday he was working on a little tune. He sat on the piano. He's like, this is the tune I'm coming up with, you know, just yesterday. And he started making so beautiful music. And Matt Saigakin is here representing also. Uh, and I'm Javier Alondo. I've been here for uh, quite a while now, 15 years. And uh, so I'm just thrilled and happy that we have this opportunity to bring uh, wonderful musicians to this festival and also the conversation. And I'm sorry, I'm Lisa from the library. If you have questions, please speak into the mic for the recording. Okay, so uh, into the mic, okay. Um, so we heard a lot of really like amazing history about the African-American music tradition from Mr. LeBlanc, which was really, it was fascinating on the, side of Latin American music, like from Mr. Santos, um, I feel like, and also talking about uh, Professor Bar Barrero as well, um, I feel like we heard kind of these anomalous stories almost, and maybe I'm misinterpreting that. I don't mean to suggest something that's not true, but that was the impression that came to me was that there are these kind of like pop-ups or pockets of culture that get expressed. But I do know there's a 
huge Latin American population in New Orleans, you know, and I don't know how connected individual communities are within that population, but I'd just be interested to hear more. Is there a musical culture that's kind of widespread across that community a bit that, that you've picked up on or that you've been a part of, or, you know, that might be comparable or similar in some ways to the African American community and that tradition, or, you know, what I, I'm just interested to hear more about that, that side of things. Yes. So, um, I can, I can talk a, a bit and then you guys can, can come up with uh, your own experiences. Um, the Latin American community here is, a, is more of a, a Central American community uh, from Honduras, Mexico. There's very incredible musicians that, uh, that have worked in the quarter and they also have worked in, with American bands. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, of Roberto Chueto. I'm thinking of uh, yeah, Julian Juli Cesar, which are from Guatemala, like Brenda. And, uh, and, and wonderful musicians, also uh, drum players, and, uh, and uh, they bring their own uh, genres, of course, like Honduras Punta. Uh, they do their own uh, type of music, like in my case, uh, Cuban music, salsa and all that. So there is a space for that too, but there is also a, a space for us to include other musicians. Like in my band, my horn players are, are from here. They're not Cuban, you know? And so that also gives the opportunity of anybody else to learn a little bit of my culture, my Cuban music or his Brazilian music, you know? So I think that uh, for more than oh, everybody is doing their own background music, right? Or their, 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 their own national music that, where they come from, um, we're in New Orleans, so we get it exposed to that melting pot, you know, that, that always is going to uh, try to uh, make us change a little bit or adapt, you know, so with what we have and what we're working with, you know, and that's wonderful because then the music evolves in a different way. Well, I was just going to mention historically that, that um, Jelly Roll Morton referred to the Spanish tinge, which is that kind of uh, the rhythm, a lot of it's at one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Uh, and um, that relates back to early history in New Orleans of the Haitians that were thrown out of Cuba during the Napoleonic era that moved to New Orleans, I think it was something like 9,000 people, it was about a third of the population at the time. So, you know, the French Quarter is mostly Spanish, right, all the, ar the architecture and the, because of the fires, and uh, a lot of the maybe the shotgun houses, that's still debatable, but I think the, the level of Latin influence on the New Orleans music is really profound, and I think that's what makes it so unique in the States, the interpretation through that. But when I was growing up, um, flamenco music was really big in this town, and there were many, many flamenco players, and now there's much less... Uh, was it Carlos Sanchez? Mm -hmm. He was here for a long time. He played uh, various concerts. I sponsored him at Loyola once. And um, before that, there were many players. A lot of those graduated on to, to classical or jazz and moved away. Or one of them became an English teacher, I think. And you know, but um, so that I don't know if that was in other areas as well. But that but was historically, my there were waves of uh, migration and immigration from Latin America to New Orleans, you know, being a poor city. And then you have like the history of the bananas and the exploitation put together by the, by the United Fruit Company, you know, that's in itself, you know, it's one of the things And New Orleans being the hub and being right and like in the, basically the gate of the United States through the Mississippi River, you know, have a lot of people from that region, just like being here because of that specific history. And uh, like moving forward, you know, I'm not really sure about like the in-betweens, you know, from that to Katrina, but talking about the Brazilian population in New Orleans, for Katrina, you know, like after, you know, like the, the destruction caused by the, by the, the breakage of the levee, you had uh, Brazilian people, you know, it was around 6,000 people in 2000, like towards the end of 2005, beginning of 2006, come to New Orleans to rebuild the city, you know? So you do have uh, the presence of like, a, I would say, you know, like maybe the largest amount of Brazilian people that came at one time in New Orleans historically at that specific point. And people, you know, like left after, afterwards, but a lot of folks stayed around. And as of right now, you know, I don't know how big the, the, the Brazilian population is in town, but you do have kind of a hub, you know, and, and whenever, you know, like, some some like the samba events and 
and uh, more like uh, uh, events kind of related to uh, popular music happen, you do have a lot of these people come out. I'm going to give a shout out to the Venezuelans in New Orleans. <laughs> there are some fabulous Venezuelan musicians here as yes, well. Yes, yes, absolutely. Emmanuel Arteaga has, has been part of our festival as well, playing Venezuela music with, uh, with Yulene. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's wonderful to be able also to, to include that, that piece. Um, I, um, I'm glad that the, the question of the, the Spanish tinge uh, came up. Uh, I can uh, plug, uh, I teach a class, uh, the Latin tinge, uh, that talks about all these things. And uh, a great source on it is um, the, the former Hogan Jazz Archive director, Bruce Rayburn, uh, wrote a book, uh, wrote an article beyond the Spanish tinge that according to his estimates, which are very much based on kind of meticulous primary sources, he, uh, with a, a kind of broad definition of, of Latin uh, that included the uh, Isleños, so uh, people from the Canary Islands that have such a long history here in the city in, or outside the city in St. Bernard Parish, uh, and then uh, also people like Jelly Roll Morton with Haitian descent. Uh, he estimated that it was 24% of the, uh, the first generation of uh, jazz performers. Um, so that it's, it's baked in, right? It's not just a tinge, I guess, is like the, the theme of the semester as we go along and to read uh, the different sources. Uh, but actually, uh, Carl, I had a question for you. I, I loved so much uh, the Discovery of Voyager uh, performance at the Music Box Village. Uh, and it was from there that I learned that you had a connection with Sun Ra. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about it. So you played with, with Sun Ra? Yes, I played with Sun Ra for eight years. Uh, uh, and when I graduated sooner, I found out that my teacher, Kid Jordan, uh, Edward Jordan, had performed with the Sun Ra Orchestra in 1955, the year that I was born. So he uh, introduced me to Sun Ra, and I got so many Sun Ra stories. That would take a whole nother, <laughs> another <laughs> week, you know. But uh, yeah, I've done uh, quite a few recordings with him. There's some videos online, uh, Chicago Fest 81, you could see me intermittently. Mm, that, was a, that was a big learning experience in my life. I guess I could say I learned more from Sun Ra than I did from anybody, from everybody else all together in my life, you know, because he would rehearse eight, ten hours a day. We'd just sit there rehearsing, you know. It, but I'd like to comment on something y'all were talking about with the Latin tinge and the, and the uh, South American music. Y'all, of course, y'all as educators know that that can't be separated from the African rhythms, right? I don't need to go say, but the, uh, doesn't need to be said, but the New Orleans rhythm, the closest I get to it is, it's like compound triplets, three against two. Like if you have the one, two, one, two, and you put the triplets against that, uh, uh, uh. It comes out to um, bum, 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 bum. That's part, pretty much how the New Orleans rhythm is built on, on that. And it has, goes by many names, you know, uh, Legba, uh, the Bambula, uh, and all those different names for that rhythm. But it, it crosses the culture, culture all over the uh, African diaspora, you know. Right. I remember Don Bappi in, in a conversation. Uh, and one of his concerts with the, with the audience, he he would say just that, you know, that as a kid, he would just go, you know, on uh, on the bus ride, da 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 da, da. Yeah. and he's like, you know, it's like that sense of syncopation we all have, that you know, that brings you also joy and excitement, right? I, I wanted to say something. Um, we haven't mentioned uh, one of the great guitarists who's uh, and Catherine Hobgood Ray just wrote a book about Snoozer Quinn. And Snoozer is, um, was basically unknown uh, 
here and pretty much everywhere, he recorded a deathbed recording uh, in 1949 that Johnny Wiggs, the trumpet player, did while he was in, I'm not sure if it was Charity Hospital, some hospital. But he played with Paul Whiteman, and he was a, a fingerstyle player with a unique technique where he, instead of playing alternating bass with his thumb, he would brush the chord. He would play the four beat of a swing feel with his thumb and play melody on top of it. It was a very, very, very complex style. And the book, and Brian Prunka did a bunch of transcriptions of the music, uh, and it was a, the recording was a, uh, sold by a tax accountant in Manassas, West Virginia. And it was recently reissued as a CD in the last four years. So if you love uh, guitar and fingerstyle guitar, uh, he is a unique anomaly in the history of fingerstyle, Snoozer Quinn. And also, uh, Matt mentioned um, uh, Lonnie Johnson, uh, who is greatly underrated as a fingerstyle player. He was the first guy that I've heard on recordings to bend strings. He could play, he was a really fine blues, like pentatonic soloist who recorded with Louis Armstrong, uh, Mahogany Hall Stomp, for example. Um, and he was an incredible fingerstyle player. And most of the modern fingerstyle movement starts with uh, uh, Mississippi John Hurt. It's kind of the folk ideal of it. but. Lonnie Johnson was way beyond that in terms of his technique and ability. He was an astounding player. It's like listening to Django Reinhardt. You just can't believe that it's there. Great player. Now, I'm glad for our visitors, you know, that get that also, um, you know, that uh, always listen or hear about jazz. And then you're here in New Orleans and, and also discovering some other names, you know, not only Django Reinhardt, like Lonnie Johnson and other people that um, were part of uh, the musical scene here in the city. You know what I think is so great about this city is that it's, the music is organic here. You know, a lot of, if you go to New York or, uh, you know, there's a lot of really studied people, but here it grows up in a family sense, like Carl was talking about, even though it wasn't his family, it was families that he was pulled into. And uh, that's what's astounding about this city, that it's just, it's just part of the fabric. All of you play guitar, so who influenced you the most? If you could only pick one person, who influenced you the most? And I'd like to hear from everybody. How, how does somebody pick one person? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I know, I know, it's hard, but if you had to pick someone, was it like the first person you heard playing guitar, or was it somebody that you studied under, or was it somebody, or somebody that you like to listen to? See, that's two different questions. The person who influenced you might not be the person who you like. You know, I mean, who you like the most, you know, because I liked people like John McLaughlin and Hendrix the most, but then the person that influenced me the most, I would say, that pointed me in a direction where I thought my voice was, would have to be Benson, who was like the next generation of Wes Montgomery, who was the next generation of Charlie Christian. So, I mean, uh, it's kind of hard, like he said. Uh, I'd have to say Benson, I guess, B before, before the commercial uh, market Benson. Yeah. George? Yes. Okay. I was just listening to him this morning. <laughs> well, um, I, I was, I started out similar to Carl where someone got me a guitar and um, it sat for like a year or two and I didn't know what to do with it and I um, went to finally get lessons with a guitar teacher in my hometown, um, Doug Hartwell, and, uh, uh, and then later a classical guitarist named Peter Clemente in my hometown and, and, I, and, and I had a school teacher named Miss Giannini who taught music theory and I think um, one, having moved to New Orleans, you know, in some sense, that's a very typical way for an American kid to, to get started as a teacher to kind of lift you up, you know. Um, and I think sometimes in New Orleans, people talk about New Orleans like everything is so natural, like you grow up here and, you know, you come out of the womb going, you know, da 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 like, like Carl's ringtone, you know. Like somehow you're just born here and you're a great musician. And I... I I, like, like Javier was talking about um, Elias Barrero, and, and so was Carl, I really try to draw attention to those educators that, um, 
that, that, that if you, ha you, you see that interest in a kid usually or even someone in their 20s and, you, and, you and they kind of point, you know, they say, you got you to gotta go that way, right? That, you know, the, the, the technique, the basic, um, you know, I think for most musicians, um, we have a sound in our head and then how, how is it, it's got to get out of your head and usually you need somebody to help you, you know, and um, so I, those are the people I always think of as the people who kind of, you know, uh, uh, lift you up. Yeah. I think for me, you know, I had two main pivotal points on uh, like in, uh, in terms of like influence in, in my, my music trajectory. And one of them was my, my uh, jazz teacher back in Brazil. He was uh, like a, a, violin, a violinist from, from Uruguay. His name was Ho, uh, Rodolfo Padilla. And he basically, you know, opened my eyes to like the possibility of like using, you know, like the possi uh, like you can read music. So read these charts in here to have like these solos by Django Reinhardt, you know, let's learn Django Reinhardt music note by note. So I was learning stuff by ear and then, you know, like he's like for you to like know everything he was doing, read the chart and then kind of like proof it with your ear. And then, you know, moving forward, you know, the, the path that I'm following right now, you know, my influence is right here, Mr. Colbert. Because like I said, in 2012, when I met him, I was like focused on becoming a jazz musician and becoming a jazz guitarist and focusing on, you know, transitioning from playing Jungle Reinhard and Gypsy Jazz swing music to playing West Montgomery. And he said like, you know, just think about it, you know, like you have all of this, so maybe you can just like blend them together and that's where I'm at right now. You know, like using the classical technique, using the pick technique and just like doing like solo guitar and composition, blending everything together. You know, so like those two guys. For me, growing up in, in Cuba, and Rafael can attest to that, I think we all had uh, one huge uh, reference. It was Leo Brauer. And Leo Brauer, of course, uh, if you did not work directly uh, with him, you worked indirectly with him. You know, I was, I consider Joaquin Clerch my, my older brother, and I would, with 12 years old, take lessons with him, even though he's just, he was just 16 at the time. And, but he took lessons directly with him. And I think he brought the sense of a broader sense to the guitar, uh, meaning that the musical heroes were not, on, not only uh, Segovia or guitars, but now there were, it was um, Horowitz or it was Rubinstein or it was Hacha Heifetz and it made us listen to other things, orchestral works and, and stuff that will, you know, make us uh, think outside of the box and, 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 you know, treat the guitar as more of an orchestra which has been described like that for other composers. But I think that uh, that was important also that the fact that he was a composer and the fact that he also worked with uh, popular musicians, you know. Um, he had a Grupo de Experimentación Sonora where he worked with many songwriters and, and popular musicians and jazz musicians where they all will just get together and, and brainstorm and, and do compositions under his leadership. And he taught then, you know, the, the basics of music form and, you know, uh, and, uh, and polyphonic texture and uh, counterpoint and, and harmony and everything else to all these musicians that had no idea. So I think that that is our main reference, Leo, but I, would, I, I wouldn't have to say. Well, uh, within New Orleans particularly, for my technique and my ability to play, I think Elias did more than any other person. Um, and by the way, he brought Leo Brower here and smuggled his Torres guitar out of Cuba, which you, I'm sure you've heard the story. But, um, and that was a great master class as well. Um, Snooks Eaglin to me um, showed me the joy. I mean, he, he was just a brilliant player, and, but great groove great player, but he just had this way of making you, I call it an epiphany, you know, and I have these at Jazz Fest, you know, where only at this place in time, only here, I'm sure maybe you've experienced them at jazz funerals, uh, I do when they sing I'll Fly Away, you know, I just, I just melt. And um, Snooks brought that to the table every time I ever heard him play or talk to him. He just had that I guess you could call it entertainment, but it was feeling, 
and and I think that's the thing that sometimes I forget, you know, is how your people respond to you by the feeling and not by the technique or anything. And and I think Snooks brought that for me, always brought it back to me. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Very good. Well, I don't want to keep uh, anybody much longer because we have a great uh, uh, performance at the, at the chapel by uh, the winner of the Elias Barrero Young Artist Competition, the last uh, uh, winner. So uh, Samuel Heinz is going to be playing a, a wonderful program now at, at noon. So I invite everybody to be there and go and enjoy also the, the concerts we have uh, tonight by Nick Giraldo, Jay Kaczerski, Lina Morita, and tomorrow by Maestro uh, Rafael Padron and Javier Garcia Verdugo. Tonight is 7. To, tonight is at 7, 7.30. 7.30 at the recital hall. Tomorrow, 7.30 at the recital hall. And then Friday we close with Christian Puy, Flamenco, and Mahmoud. Uh, Moroccan music, so it's a little bit the, the African influences in the guitar, Northern African influences. So I think that it's a great uh, program. We had a wonderful um, possibility of, of, of showcasing different different types. Recital hall means Dixon. Yes, well, no, the Dixon Recital Hall, which is the smaller one. Uh, oh, yes. thank you. Right. Tonight and tomorrow, and then we close it at the Dixon Hall with the flamenco. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so so much. Thank you, Lisa, for giving the, us the opportunity. I think this is a wonderful thing. <laughs>